So for the afternoon, I'd like to introduce um, Faranak. And Faranak is a socio-cultural research, so socio-technical researcher in the Oxford Research Group. And she's also an honorary research associate at the School of Sociology in Bristol. She collaborates with experts from various disciplines to study the social and ethical issues surrounding the technologies of personalised medicine using a range of qualitative and computational approaches. And I really want to welcome um, Faranak and thank her because the other thing that, that we must do as black women is, is seek out allies. And Faranak is an ally who's working with us to change personalised medicine. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. Thanks, Jenny, for the introduction. Um, yes, I don't have a genetics background, and um, I research how societies and technologies and science shape each other and evolve together and how we can um, try to intervene in this evolution to try to direct them towards a point where their benefits are equally um, distributed. Um, so I would like to start by saying a little bit about the importance of having um, diverse data in genomics. So we all have a, approximately 99.9% .9 of our uh, DNA sequence in common. And studying that 0.1% that varies between us can advance our understanding of how genetic factors may contribute to disease or to protection from disease. That's why scientists um, study genetic differences between individuals and groups. If a variant is common, then it is unlikely to be disease-causing. And if it is rare, it may be disease-causing. But again, that will depend on so many other uh, factors, such as environmental or social factors. Um, so the picture is a bit more complex because there are basically more genetic variations within ancestral groups than between them. So if you consider to individuals from a North African and East African ancestry, then the genetic differences between them is more than individuals from European and African ancestry. And so if we only have European ancestry uh, populations in terms of da their data, then um, we won't get useful insight about what variants are common or rare in, for example, a North African ancestry group. So all of this is to say that um, having access to diverse data is really important if we want to advance genomic medicine for all ancestry groups. Um, however, genomics has got a diversity problem at the moment. So most of uh, the uh, data repositories that hold genomic data and most of the genomic studies that are conducted using these data are skewed towards the data of individuals from um, European ancestry. And so the insights that are derived, the knowledge that are derived from these data are less useful for other ancestral groups because it's really difficult to classify variants correctly. So a lot of times for um, people who are underrepresented in the data, um, it's possible that variants get misclassified or are labeled as um, variants of unknown significance. And so there was an example of this um, by Harvard researchers who um, were studying hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and they had a data set that overrepresented European ancestry population. And so they first originally um, classified a variant as disease causing, but later on they discovered that actually this was a common variant among African ancestry population, and so they had to reclassify it as benign. Um, so, as you can see, um, this type of problem can scale. And the, with the more well-established repositories and biobanks, as more researchers access these data, the problem of bias that is inherent in genomic data because of lack of diversity gets worse because data comes with these embedded inequalities, the technologies and devices that are being developed can inherit this and even amplify them. So the problem of lack of diversity is now well recognized in genomics. And um, 
it's quite well known that in order to improve um, the evidence base for our ancestors, we need diverse data. Um, scientists and clinicians have been calling for diversity in genomics for more than a decade now. Um, however, it's really more complex than just recruiting uh, more people from underrepresented groups and collecting their data. And that's where um, our review came in. So um, Genomic England, um, Genomics England um, data, they, um, Diverse Data Initiative commissioned us to conduct a review on the challenges of diversifying genomic data and the ethical, legal, and social issues around it. We were an, an interdisciplinary team, and we had about four and a half months, and we reviewed literature and held a workshop to consult with the experts in the field to complement our analysis with their um, recommendations. And um, so we reviewed this data and generated a report about the ethical issues. Um, there were some limitations to our reviews, for example, in terms of the papers that we reviewed. Um, they were mostly from North America. And also, um, we mainly focused on underrepresentation in terms of race, ethnicity, and gender. And so that left out other underserved groups, uh, such as children, elderly, psychiatric patients, or prisoners, and so on. Um, the key finding, we, have, we had a number of findings, but one of the main findings that, um, well, I, I'll just focus on a few of them here. And the first one was that we figured that the literature was saying that many research practices are exclusionary and need to change. So, um, for example, they may not consider the social setting in which the potential participants are situated. Um, and an example of that is that for a group, for example, group concerns may be very significant, um, but and group con consent may be very significant, but actually many practices may mm, overlook this and only care about individual consent. Um, the, so this could be um, problematic because um, the literature actually basically suggested that more practices need to have cultural humility, which is something that refers to um, having reflexivity and be doing active listening and trying to take responsibility for interactions on the side of researchers and research institutions. So the literature also highlighted the key role of co-design in all stages of um, attempts to diversify um, the data. And co-design um, requires a mindset that recognizes potential participants as active researchers and knowledge producers. And without this mindset, it's really easy for co-design to become tokenistic and exacerbate um, issues or create new forms of issues. Um, the other thing that came up from the literature and also from consultation with the experts in the workshop was uh, the significance of structural issues that may influence the attempts to generate diverse data by um, participants and researchers. One of these was that um, a lot of, sometimes, some researchers view data as neutral. And this actually can neglect the fact that technologies and data are not really separable from the social context in which they're uh, situated. And they can inherit the social biases and social inequalities that we have in our societies. Um, the second was that uh, attempts to diversify data must be contextualized within the um, historical trajectory of structural racism and legacies of colonialism. It's easy for a lot of researchers to forget about that. Um, also, um, that finally, um, there's another point about politics of classification. Categorization and classification of population are inherently political and have political consequences. And so they must be closely interrogated. Clearly, there is a real problem that if we don't have data sets that are representative, then for informing genomic tests, then the outcome is worse for those that are not represented in the data. And it's an example of structural racism, where you have a system where you're basically um, quality of um, tests and your chances of accessing that 
is actually so influenced by your ancestry. Um, but getting those data sets more representative needs to be a part of a bigger effort to um, get the whole genomic enterprise more diverse. And um, just collecting genomic data from a people of range of ancestors is not going to in itself address the problem that, that these calls for diversity are trying to um, tackle, which is the staggering inequalities. So the key message from our review was that um, diverse data are not ethical in and of themselves, and they need to be contextualized. And if the wider social, historical, and political um, context that shapes the lives of par participants are neglected, then um, issues can be exacerbated. So instead, we need to try to ensure that harms and benefits are distributed equally, and that the knowledge that we are co-producing is the knowledge that the diverse population is interested in knowing. And also, um, finally, that, um, that that knowledge is fed back, the benefits of it is fed back to the diverse populations. So we did this review, but we came up with more questions than answers. And so really we are trying to, like one of the areas that we are working on at the moment is co-design. We are trying to understand what are the best practices and what's the best ways of doing it. So I would like to share these questions with you just in case you have any thoughts on them. So in terms of co-design, what matters? What is missing? What does meaningful contribution look like or doesn't look like? And how we can bring the lived experiences of individuals to inform the future contributions. Thank you. If you have any questions, then I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Any questions? We've got a few minutes. Sure. Um, one thing I've found, and I think historically, um, trying to reach and uh, engage minoritized populations, the black community, in um, research is a lack of trust and a lack of wanting to engage with what may be perceived as an organization or an, an enterprise or an, an initiative, another initiative that doesn't really have our best interest at heart. So how do you propose going about essentially just dealing with the fact that many black communities don't want to engage with research because of historical I think that's a really good question. And the, the thing that our review pointed towards is so much about working on trustworthiness as, or on the part of researchers and institutions, as opposed to just blaming you know, potential participants because of their mistrust. Um, so there was also some literature that came up that said actually it might be that we assume too much about this mistrust. Because a lot of times, because of structural racism that exists, Participants don't actually, black participants particularly, don't get invited as much to the trials as much as everybody else because of those assumptions. So it's so complicated and it feels like there's so much work that needs to be done. Sorry, so, sorry, so somebody was before you. Sorry. I'm, I'm interested because a lot of researchers pride themselves on being colored blind and not seeing, um, or men but pride themselves, but. The, the, the research is inherently colorblind and, and don't want to, because of the history of maybe eugenics and historical things, are not uh, aware of, of bringing ethnicity, race into it, and talking about the social constructs. How would you challenge that um, assertion? I guess that's where cultural humility comes in, because, yeah, cause, yeah if, if that's like a um, baseless pride, then, then it needs to be challenged, right? So I, I think that it is a problem that not many practices do actually show that sort of humility at the moment and don't engage and don't acknowledge the historical atrocities before like even you know trying to engage with participants um, but I don't have a solution for, for so I don't know if uh, you have any thoughts yourself um, so I, I would say that actually although to some extent we should be should um, treat every participant equally but to some extent we should be it is worth acknowledging the, the different lived experiences of, of different groups of people. And so colour blinds can be unhelpful as well as, well as helpful. Sure, sure. Yeah. 
Sorry, who's the flat? Very quick. Um, I appreciated how your language and talking about ancestral groups um, avoids the danger that a lot of this genomics thing has of biologizing race. You cannot look at somebody and know their ancestral group. You really cannot. And so I wanted to appreciate that. And also to say that I heard several times, it's not even about within the UK or within the US. Uh, trying to get more minoritized, you know, people of color into these databases. Really, it's a global effort because of the uh, the databases being European based. So we need to bring whole regions of the earth into the database, not just individuals within. That's wrong. Certain yeah, of course, yeah, that's a really good point. Well, thank, thank you. you. For those two. Cheers. Okay, thank you very much. Cheers.